Director at the Simon Center, which is part of the Command and General Staff College Foundation. And on behalf of our partner in this, the Command and General Staff School, Colonel Robert Alt, Mr. Marv Nichols, we welcome you to this interagency brown bag lecture series that is designed to enhance your interagency ed education here at the Command and General Staff School. This lecture series is brought to you by a grant from the First Command Financial Services, and they've also provided water for us here today, so thank you, First Command. I want to bring a couple items to your attention. Our next interagency brown bag lecture series will be on 12 October, so mark your calendars. Should be kind of interesting as well. We've got the FBI coming in to talk about homegrown violent extremists. So it'll be right here, 1230, 12 October, presentation by the FBI. I also want to point out that we have this coming Wednesday, downtown in the Lofts Event Center on 2nd Street, our first in the series of Pershing Lectures, that's World War I Lecture Series, where Dr. Scott Stevenson will be talk, giving a presentation on the German home front. So if World War I interests you as a topic of interest, I urge you to come down and take a look at it. That'll be at 5.30, starting downtown. Today's presentation is on the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. It's a unique organization in that it's both a combat support agency working under the Department of Defense, as well as an inter intelligence agency that's part of the U.S. intelligence community. We all probably use NGA products and services every day and don't even know it. We're privileged to have to present to, a, present to us today Mr. Ralph Irwin. He's the NGA liaison to TRADOC and obviously here at CAC at the school. Mr. Irwin is a senior geospatial intelligence officer who holds the designation from the Director of National Intelligence as an intelligence community officer. He served our country for over three decades as an Army officer, as a program director, and as an intelligence officer. He deployed to Afghanistan in 2011 to serve as a senior mentor to the Afghan Geodesy and Cartography Head Office. Mr. Irwin's a graduate of Wentworth Military Academy, and he holds a BA in Mathematics from Cameron University and a Master's of Strategic Studies from the U.S. Army War College. It's my pleasure to welcome Mr. Ralph Irwin. Thanks, Rod. Appreciate that. All right. So, good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction, Rod. I appreciate that. I appreciate you coming and, and uh, for let me have an opportunity to have a conversation with you and uh, talk about things called geospatial. Uh, a lot of you may know what that is, uh, and as Rod said, you may access it and use it and not know it uh, every day. Uh, now, the last two days in the class for the students, you've been in I had a space operations class. So you had an orientation of that orbit, what that means, and those sensors and what they're doing. And so NGA is dependent upon space also, uh, in addition to other platforms for collection of information. And I'll talk about what that information is. First, because I'm the first one of our small group of, from the intelligence community, I think it's necessary for you to understand that you may not know that under the Director of National Intelligence, there are 16 agencies. Of those 16 agencies of the U.S. government, there's some primary intelligence agencies from the National Reconnaissance Office, National Security Agency, D Defense Intelligence Agency, Central Intelligence Agency, uh, and NGA. And so those are the central intelligence apparatus of the U.S. government. And then also the services also have an intelligence arm. I'll talk about some of those later, of what those service arms are and how we are integrated with them in talking geospatial information. And then we get into other departments of the U.S. government, whether it's the drug enforcement, commerce, transportation, homeland security. And so we're very involved in those. But as you go through the entire school year and talk about intelligence, that's the entire apparatus, and we also collaborate with the international community. And so that's very important to understand the intelligence community of the U.S. government. Getting specific in GeoInt, so geospatial intelligence gets down to that where you are, what it is, and why is it important. And so looking at layers of information, and so we take layers. We consider different layers of information as we start to build 
a story or a product and provide you information necessary to make the right decisions. I'll talk about some of those layers as we go through. One of the pieces is we do build maps. This is not an NGA map. This is from the Roanoke Times and it's pretty recent. Do you see any problems with that map? So there's North Carolina. And there's the other North Carolina. Oh no, wait a minute. There's West Virginia and another West Virginia. Don't always trust what you see. That just happens to be a very current production uh, that got pushed around the internet in the geospatial world. Uh, had to be very apropos for this particular conference for us to talk about it is that this is all good from the National Weather Service, but somebody had to build a map. So the migration, the enduring legacy of NGA really started back here with George Washington uh, of the U.S. He was surveying, and that term that Rod said a minute ago, geodesy, geodesy equals surveying the land in order for us to get accurate coordinates on the Earth's surface. George Washington was a surveyor. If we start talking about evolution of Lewis and Clark, they were on a cartography mission. Uh, they were on a land navigation and intelligence collection of the culture of the land, the physical land, and taking a look at that and for them to map that. We start to continue to evolve, whether it's the balloons and getting into cartography. And so today is an anniversary of a famous cartographer. Uh, in 1502, uh, Christopher Columbus made his fourth uh, trip to the, uh, to the Western world. He went to Costa Rica, fourth trip, his last trip. Uh, so he came, and this is an anniversary today. Um, so it just happens, cartography, that was his trade. Christopher Columbus was one of those early cartographers. We emerged into uh, the satellites that Tom Gray talked about to the class, uh, looking the first time when we had wet film that was collecting information on the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so why the first time that we were doing that, uh, after I believe 11 attempts, it was finally able to capture uh, that wet film as it dropped, parachuted down uh, to collect it because we didn't have the ability we have today to collect with satellites, uh, the first satellites. So this Cold War, that's where it emerged. We had Oxcart and we also had the SR-71, uh, those platforms that were originally with the CIA. Uh, those moved and supported the Cold War mission. Uh, then we moved into the Defense Mapping Agency and then moved into the National Imagery and Mapping Agency. So this progression. We even got into getting our geospatial data from the International Space, I'm sorry, the Space Shuttle. So the Space Shuttle did some collection for us of elevation data, which is critical for us to put contour lines on maps and other information for line of sight and other information that's necessary. Now we get down to where post 9-11, and so post 9-11, a lot of things have changed. Uh, we've had the support to OIF and OEF. Uh, we've had that support to humanitarian uh, crisis as they've occurred, and we've even emerged into things like the Ebola crisis. Uh, we did some things. This is an Afghan country atlas. So we built atlases for Afghanistan. Uh, we built those at a, at a scale necessary required by the warfighter, and these became very portable, uh, very necessary. We also collaborated. This was made by the UK. The UK made this in collaboration with the US government for parts of the urban area of Kandahar. Uh, that was part of a collaboration and a co-production. So we did that. We also did, built these for Haiti. So these are Haiti atlases. And so we, I, we built these and we provide those as part of the humanitarian assistance and disaster relief uh, support. And so that's part of our mission and we continue that mission uh, along that timeline. And as you see here, I'll talk a little bit more about the modeling we did and support we did in specifically for uh, the raid on the bin Laden compound. This is a screen capture from NGA's public internet page just nga.mil, and at nga.mil we get into our current hurricane support. We're supporting the Department of Homeland Security. 
in providing them geospatial information necessary for the U.S. government for U.S. national interest. And the same as our Arctic uh, support is in collaboration with the National Science Foundation. And so we have that direct support. So you can go on the public internet page and take a look at that and understand what our support is and the role is uh, for us and the criticality of the Arctic uh, in particular to the U.S. government. So the director likes to talk about what got us here. This talks about that Cuban Missile Crisis and looking at missile silos in Russia, uh, the early transition. There's capturing that first corona uh, wet film imagery and migration to commercial imagery platforms, worldview. We're using commercial imagery more than you would ever believe. Uh, this kind of migrates to the Chernobyl and Chernobyl explosion for our ability to capture that. And then getting down to this world right here. And that world, those are the current satellites. There's a company called Planet Labs or planet.com. And you can go and see what their 190 uh, dove satellites that are flying around the Earth right now in, a, in an orbit. And so those single satellites, these are the satellites on the shelf as they were flying. So the students know, Tom mentioned 104 of those shot from an Indian rocket uh, just recently. They launched into space and now they're in collection of imagery around the world. So what got us here uh, will not get us to the next step. And so we have to look at the world a little bit differently and we have to do the integration of that social media and media information. We have to integrate the commercial industry. We have to integrate international partners. So I mentioned the UK and helping us doing the one development. Uh, inter other governments, other think tanks, the academics. So NGA is very involved with some of the academia that's around the Beltway, but then also University of Missouri is one of the major contributors to NGA and our collaboration with academia. Uh, I'm going to play a short video. Uh, this short video is the statement for the record to the, to the House Armed Services Committee, Subcommittee on Strategic Forces, for the FY18 priorities and posture of the National Security Space Enterprise. And this is Robert Cardillo, who's the director of NGA. Chance? Thank you, Ms. Sapp. I'm sure not recognize Mr. Cardillo for five minutes. Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Cooper, members of the committee, I too am pleased to testify before you here today with my distinguished colleagues and as a member of the team of national security professionals. Uh, NGA is the primary provider of geospatial intelligence, or GEOINT, for the Department of Defense and the intelligence community. Our support to military services, combatant commands, and warfighters include safety to navigation, precise targeting, disaster recovery, and tailored intelligence support, just to name a few. I also have the job of being the functional manager for the National System of Geospatial Intelligence. And I strengthen the overall enterprise by ensuring that those combatant command needs are met through future overhead architectures. More specifically, the GEO and Enterprise Capability Document, which serves as the framework to translate those needs into the key enterprise functions and capabilities that our analysts require to resolve our most vexing intelligence challenges. Now, Global Persistent GEOINT provides an architecture to monitor these in intelligence challenges, enables NGA to provide national and tactical leaders the intelligence and early warning needed for decision advantage. It leverages the exquisite capabilities of the National Reconnaissance Office to allow the combatant commands to hold strategic targets at risk. It also integrates the capabilities of our international partners to fill gaps in our enterprise. Now, the explosion of data has driven the GEONET discipline beyond the limits of human interpretation and exp explanation. By combining all of the data now available to us and to use uh, with the use of algorithms, automated processing, machine-to-machine -machine learning, and artificial intelligence, we believe we can automate as much as 75% or more of the rote tasks we perform today. This will free our analysts to spend more time on the, and focus on those hard intelligence problems. Getting to that point will require significant investments in our IT architecture as well, in our re, as well as in our research and development. 
Not only is that data exploding, conservative estimates over the next 10 years predict that over 9,000 commercial satellites will be launched, compared to fewer than 1,500 in the last 10 years. Accordingly, NRO will partner, or NGA will partner with the NRO to engage with and access this, the most mature of these new space via the commercial geoint activity. Through it, we will identify and evaluate emerging commercial geoint data and services against those needs uh, that we capture and maintain. In closing, the national. <laughs> Uh, so, he made a, he had a statistic there uh, that's countering, or it complements what Tom Gray talked about at the space operations. You remember what that was on the quantity of satellites? 9,000. So, Tom's talking today, we're talking approximately 2,000, and 9,000 within the next decade. That starts to get into the collection of big data. And so, big data is a significant, uh, how do we exploit that? He talked about the ability for uh, artificial intelligence and other means to exploit that data. And so that's a whole new paradigm, especially for the military, um, on how to exploit that. Part of the way that we, NGA, as a national agency, support that is putting people out front. And so in support of COCOMs, in support of the agencies and departments within the U.S. government, in support of the services, and we get into the services, we get into their intelligence centers. So the National Air and Space Intelligence Center at wright Pat, the National Ground Intelligence Center at Charlottesville, um, the Office of Naval Intelligence, and the Marine Corps Intelligence Activity. We are embedded in those. I am lucky enough to be a member of this Army uh, service team in providing support to the Title 10 function of the Army as you do the preparation uh, for your missions. And we also have international teams, so those international teams are embedded in those locations to support those other international partners. And so it becomes very important for us to be forward instead of sitting back in Washington, D.C. or St. Louis at our two major headquarters. So those people that are going forward those people have different trade crafts or specialists, and they're a combination of all the things of maritime or aeronautical or cartographers or even orbital scientists. And so those are smart folks that those 14,500 people uh, that the government, the U.S. government is depending upon those people every day uh, to provide that support. Uh, it's a small number for a large mission. Um, so part of that mission is safety of navigation. Uh, Robert Cardello mentioned that, uh, safety of navigation. There's not an aircraft that goes in the air or a ship that goes in the water in which they don't have an NGA product in their hand. Uh, they have it, and so sometimes those are good and sometimes there's some errors. There was a minesweeper in 2013 that had some trouble because of a combination of GPS and operator error and the chart on the ship. Uh, that minesweeper did hit a phantom island uh, and had problems. Uh, I could discuss that with you if you wanted to know more, uh, but that safety of navigation, if the Titanic would have had NGA around, we would have told them there were icebergs around there. And so the Titanic would not have fed it, met its fate. So we also get into where do we get our data? So we're from space. Space is a primary collection platform, but we also use manned and unmanned uh, platforms to the collection, uh, collecting the information we need. And so with this information that I've been referring to, this is kind of what I call the money slide. This describes what are we doing with this information. And so when we talk about this information, panchromatic, infrared, multispectral, hyperspectral, that information is the information we need that it's visible in the electromagnetic spectrum, visible uh, data, we're able to take that information and make it into something. And so that information that we're doing, what do you do with it? There it is. We're making it into what every soldier's had in their hand before, a 1 to 50,000 map sheet. So a 1 to 50,000 map sheet, you've all had that. It came from NGA or one of our predecessor organizations. Um, and so every soldier has depended upon that, as well as things like an evasion chart. 
so aviators know what an evasion chart is. They have these, and these can be used as a, a poncho. Uh, they also do a blood chit. Every soldier's had those. You're very familiar with these. They, can, they have a lot of information on them. And so NGA produces every one of those that's tailored to the specific geographic region. And so this product that we're generating, this map, is based upon elevation data, so we can get contour lines on the product. Uh, and also imagery, and imagery that we put into command and control systems. And so imagery, when you take your Google Maps and you hit the word satellite, you're getting true imagery. That's imagery purchased, not Google doesn't fly it, Google buys it. They buy it from a commercial imagery sensor, uh, company. And so they're buying that, and they're buying it from one of those 2,000 satellites that uh, Tom talked about. It could be the French, or the Germans, or the Italians, or the Americans, or Canadians, multiple people that are flying those satellites, company, uh, countries. On the sea is that notice to mariners, NOTAMs, NOTAMs have been around for many years, and so we provide that data all the time. Uh, safety of navigation for air and sea again, we get into vertical obstruction database. NGA provides, aviators like to know where vertical obstructions are. They like to know where cell phone towers are. And so it's our responsibility to map those, put those on the Earth's surface, so that they can access that information, uh, so that aviators don't hit cell phone towers. That's pretty important to them. Science. NGA manages the mathematical model for the GPS satellites. So it tells the GPS satellites where they're at. They don't fly them. They just tell them the mathematical model of where they're at and what time it is. And so it's an NGA responsibility. We also get into managing the gravity database. The Earth is a breathing rock. Gravity changes every day as sea level is different across the Earth. Sea level is not constant based upon gravity differences because the close gravity changes every day. Um, we get into coordinate systems. So the military grid reference system that, mil that soldiers use that are on maps, those MGRS, that's our responsibility to manage that for the U.S. government. And it's our responsibility and we do that uh, for sure, a surety uh, that we are having a, exact coordinates when we need them and where they, we need them. Um, research, human geography. Uh, so us, our ability to map cultures, religions, languages, uh, population, that's our responsibility to try to put that polygon, that general piece of information, and we were doing it in Baghdad on a daily basis. As the units were moving Jersey barriers and changing some of the, some of the, where groups were, we were having, every month we were updating maps to provide that information to war fighters so they had decisions so they would know where per particular groups were. Um, Ge geographic names. You may not be aware, but there is an organization at NGA that determines the U.S. government's spelling of the word Kandahar. So you've seen Kandahar spelled with a Q. You've seen Kandahar spelled with a K. NGA manages how is it spelled for the U.S. government so that the U.S. government has a single stance. And so how we would spell that and put that on a map product or in a database, provide that to the Department of State and other folks so that we have some a baseline of where to begin. And NGA has that geographic names responsibility. Um, there's a part on here that says land boundaries. You may have heard of the Durand line. Does anybody know what the Durand line is? Sir? The war between Pakistan and Afghanistan that the and, British drew. And who recognizes it? Nobody. Okay. <laughs> Except Mr. Durand, Dr. Durand. And when did, he, when did he designate that boundary? 1893. So the Afghanistan and Pakistan governments do not truly recognize that border. But NGA determines that border a stance for the U.S. government, that this is the border that we have. We're drawing that on, the, on a map to, say, to have a, a boundary, if you will. Uh, so that's why we always still have that five kilometer, one kilometer safety zone, if you will, uh, as we fly in that area. This is an interesting discussion of how, what satellite imagery looks like. That's a good picture of a smoke from a forest fire 
uh, in the uh, western United States. And now with imagery, we have the ability to penetrate that smoke. This is a commercial platform, the ability to penetrate that smoke and then be able to see pretty much where the hot spots are, but then our next level is the true fires. So providing that to the Joint Interagency Task Force that is fighting the fires in the western United States, we are providing that information to them uh, with a commercial platform. I mentioned I would say something about the Abbottabad compound, and so we built, NGA built this model uh, in 2010. Um, so May of 2011 is when the attack occurred on the Abbottabad compound, and in 2010 when the planning started, uh, NGA was involved in building this model in a combination of different ways, hard model, uh, soft, uh, software, uh, providing that to leaders for them to make decisions and have information available. And so one of the things, Robert Cardillo, the guy that was just in the video, so as a deputy director of national intelligence uh, at that time and his position was, uh, he was sitting in the same room when that was executed. The mission was executed in May of 2011. So this is another example of commercial imagery. This is so the 3rd of April versus the 25th of April after the landslide, the earthquake in Nepal. And so looking at the lands, uh, I'm sorry, not landslide. This is the damage in the urban area uh, in particular and the ability for us to see that and help the Nep Nepalese government with the information they needed is something we would do very easily. This was the land side information, same as in Nepal. So this was the 22nd of January versus the 2nd of May after the landslide occurred. And so we're able to get that information to help rescue people, save lives, save property, um, and get that information. This also continues that story of IDPs. So these displaced persons were able to determine that they moved here in order to uh, not be in a building during the next earthquake, the next rumble. Uh, so they were able to do that. We're able to know how many people are there or where those fields are so we can help the Nepalese government uh, as they go, go forward. Uh, NGA has that unique responsibility to provide a lot of information to war fighters. This is the primary audience today. Uh, but we also provide that information to other industries, uh, other parts of the government, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, Department of State um, and, and other entities, we provide that constant uh, support. Uh, so focus, I want to focus for a second strictly on a takeaway for the CGSOC students. And what I want to talk about is that you are in a unique position now. Because we start talking about this transition to 9,000 satellites and collecting data. And we talk about that you need to start thinking in multiple domains and you have to be anticipatory. You can't sit back and give us an RFI anymore. There's so much data that's available. We have to be anticipating what's going to be occurring. We don't have time. There's big data, a lot of data, and we need those, those smart analysts and you as a smart leader. Where are we going to look? How are we going to look? We need to anticipate what's going to be occurring. If we wait for North Korea to shoot a missile, it's too late if we don't know where it came from. We have to know exactly where it's coming from all the time, and we have to anticipate that. And you as a young military leader need to grasp that idea, that concept, and go outside your comfort zone as an intel officer in particular. Don't ask me for an RFI. Instead, anticipate where am I going to go next? Where is the enemy going to be? Where is the fault going to be? Uh, so. Uh, you need to ask those questions and think ahead of time. With that said, I, said, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and look forward to any conversations or questions you might have. Yes, sir. From NGA's perspective, uh, so I can't give an opinion, uh, no. But, um, so uh, from our perspective, it doesn't matter a lot. Uh, we're the ones that are going to be, we're the ones that are providing the tasking for the collection. Um, we're the ones that just 
you, the combatant commanders the, uh, come to us and tell us what their particular missions are, or anticipating what the hotspot is, and then they give that to us. We turn around and task the National Reconnaissance Office, whether it's the Space Command, a, a, a Space Com, uh, again, or uh, National Reconnaissance Office, they're going to collect what we tell them we need. Whether we're going to build a new one to 50,000 map sheet, or we're going to find an intel target, one or the other. If we need higher resolution targeting data, then we ask for that for a particular area. And so we're doing the tasking, they're doing the collecting. So I don't think it has a lot of impact. Sir? Yes, sir, please. The Air Force Day, two out of two. Uh, so you mentioned the cell data collection, that's obviously all stock. Uh, what's the NGA plan going forward to improve DTED oh. coverage and resolution? Great, great information. Uh, so, uh, one major item of, in, let me, let me kind of correct something. So, DTED, Digital Terrain Elevation Data, is a format. We could just as well call it a dot .doc, a dot .doc. It's a format. So, the elevation data collection, um, so we have, uh, now we're in a complete collaboration with the European Space Agency and the German government. The Germans have the highest resolution product, it's called Tandem or Terrasar. Is that right, Gary? Uh, and I'm checking with my expert here, just came out of UCOM. So, um, so Tandem is collecting higher resolution. What we got from the space shuttle in February 2000 was we knew every 30 meters, we knew an elevation reading. With the new Tandem, we have global at 12 meters. So that increases the quality of a line of sight or quality of a contour line on a map. Uh, so that's the first major leap, going from 30 meters to 12 meters globally. Um, and then higher resolution capabilities and places of interest. So good question though, yeah. Elevation data is critical. Please. So you're going to change from the Air Force to the Navy? That's good. Please. Good. Okay, um, so Google Earth, a tool, and so it again comes back to the data, so the tool being separate from the data. Um, so as an intel officer, your big concern is, of course, having the right data and being having the right tool to exploit the data. Uh, I think that one of our major challenges uh, is we all, uh, as everybody in this room, can open up their cell phone and have a map. We can all have a map instantly. Um, part of the question becomes how detail, how high resolution we want that data to be. If we're going to target something um, and I don't want collateral damage for a hospital or an orphanage next door, um, then we have to have the ability with our coalition. So of course you know we have our major five eyes, our five English speaking countries in which you, we do a day-to-day -day collaboration. But then we have another set of, of five or six, uh, eight other countries that we do a day-to-day -day collaboration with also. Uh, so that international partnership uh, is critical. Um, and so for us to get high resolution information for the intelligence community, for targeting in particular, uh, so uh, we're looking at that. Now our day-to-day, -day, uh, if, you, if you went today for a new one to 50,000 map sheet that we make, it's built on co-production. And so our co-production process is a day-to-day -day operation also on just regular transportation, hydrology, vegetation information. We're doing that co-production every sing single day. Uh, I want to come to the commercial piece, commercial imagery collection. We are doing that collaboration uh, constantly. Uh, so um, on my cell phone, as we speak, I'm able to, we're being imaged right now by a Russian satellite. A commercial Russian satellite is now imaging us. That's that red line right there. And so 
I can do that on a vendor. It's, it's, this, is, this is available for me to purchase. I could purchase that imagery right now. Anybody can purchase that imagery. Uh, and so it's a whole new world. How we have the ability in, in our coalition to turn that into a product to re respond to it. So a smart intel officer has to have the ability to anticipate what am I going to need, why do I need it, where is the target at, where is the target going to be. The combination of space-based platform, airborne platforms, manned and unmanned platforms uh, to go get the best information I need. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a continuous collaboration. Uh, I did want to, one other thing, on the tool, uh, the director, Robert Cardillo, mentioned uh, algorithms, machine-to-machine -machine language, artificial intelligence. That's what we have to have. We're spending a lot of money. As long as our research and development money still allows us to do that development, we're going to use something called activity-based intelligence. And it's just what it says. Intelligence based upon the activity. And analyzing that, a machine to analyze that for us to help us as humans look here and not there. Instead of looking at the shiny object, we look at the density of data using big data as our driver. Good question, sir. Chris. Uh, I'd like to ask, uh, the NDA work is pretty um, aggressive with the, with the public-private partnerships. They have um, permanent seats in you know, uh, Silicon Valley. Also, in the tech boom, uh, small business uh, tech in uh, St. Louis. But that's something that we're always trying to get after uh, and we want to make sure that we're ahead. And I think uh, same thing with the, our, our other Intel partners, DIA. DIA, just a couple weeks ago, he, um, they had a um, convention in St. Louis. And he was talking about DIA. I mean, they're, in, in his point of view, they're also irrelevant. They're, they're resting a lot of, on their laurels because their inability to think ahead. And uh, NGA, if you were to look at where the director talks and what he says in, um, in uh, these Senate hearings, He's, his big thing as the director is living in the open. And that's a very big change for how intel agencies typically run, which we typically live in that, that secret world and we're not out in the public. But that's changing, and that's changed over the last couple of years. And that's the, uh, the big thing for that is because we know that our relevance is only you know, good until the next day. And we're easily could be, um, mm -hmm. we're always fighting for relevance. And the, the way to do that is partnerships with the public. Thanks, Chris. Ma'am. To expand on what you just said, so are, does NGA now offer unclassed intelligence products based off of that um, relationship with the um, commercial industry? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so. And then can, to expound upon that, um, I was surprised how, on how many people are unaware on how to utilize um, the extensive resources they have, especially even in my own field in Intel. I, come across until officers all the time have a cool product show to them like oh that's how do you even find that so do you have anything you could pass out to the group or just a brief where they can go to utilize such a valuable resource yes so um, what so what I've like, done so I, what I've done uh, what I try to do personally is that I try to come staff group rooms and I'll give you a hands-on interactive uh, class on the access of about four major websites, one of those being Digital Globe, mm -hmm. to access commercial imagery that you can access, and you can access and download that imagery in the classroom here based upon your CAC card. Mm -hmm. So that's one accessibility I can show you. There's several others. The Army Geospatial Center uh, allows the water resources database in addition to other engineering route studies and other data. Uh, and NGA has another couple of other resources uh, that are accessible with your CAC card or a login and password. Uh, so I would, uh, uh, instead of handing you a piece of paper, I'd rather come to your staff group room and spend about 40 minutes and I can explain to you an awful lot of things to answer some of your questions for MI students or for all. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, I, have, I have no trouble doing that. And that's true, that's open to anybody uh, that I'm fully accessible. I've, got, I've, only got, I've only done one staff group room so far. I've got another one scheduled for this week. And so as many as I can get to, I go to them. Um, so I spend a short amount of time. Yeah, I just want to add that 2014 was the first time our intelligence information was put out in the, pu in the public facing website at NGA. And that was during the Ebola crisis. Um, this stuff right here, map making, um, all that, I mean, we've always shared that with the military for a very long time. But in terms of intelligence, uh, we've gotten, you saw some of that, like the Arctic and wildlife, 
Uh, and that's something that we've been doing. We just started doing that in 2014. So one of the very few... The Hurricane Ma Hurricane uh, Matthew was the first one, and then uh, then Irma, the, uh, the Ebola Irma, crisis. Yeah. yeah, those were the first couple. Yeah. Also Nepal. Nepal. And the reason for that is because we, we provide that information out front, so first responders as well as the military, they can take that information and do something. You guys have the capabilities within your geo and cell to create these products yourselves. And like they were saying, uh, uh, Director Cardiola was saying, our focus is we really got to be focused on these bigger issues, these bigger intelligence questions, um, and, and looking at where the next hotspot is going to be. And that's a challenge for us. But we can allow you guys this information and give it to you so you have the capability within your own shops to create these products instead of having to be an RFI to us, which, we, it, which was a business model that we used, uh, especially when NGA just first formed as NGA. And we're kind of going away from that and focusing on predicting what is the next hotspot for the United States. Thanks, Chris. Anyone else? Sir, please. Uh, does NGA deal at all with mapping cultural boundaries or religious boundaries as opposed to just the physical boundaries and terrain? Yes, we do. Uh, human, ge hum human geography domain, uh, absolutely. Uh, we do that the best we can. As you know, that's, you can't get much of that from space. Uh, so that requires that human, so that integration with the Defense Intelligence Agency uh, to bring or uh, using a host nation resource uh, to gather that information. So whether we're trying to get the number of males of military age in a particular region, uh, that kind of demographical information, there are some countries that are better at that than others, some that do it and some that don't. Uh, so we're trying to, yes, so we try to do that cultural, ethnic um, breakdown for, and religions, um, and other demographical information as much as we can, uh, and map it, uh, put it, put it on, an, put it on a, a map or an image to give you a generalization uh, of a uh, of a po of the population for your decision making process. So as you get into the decision making, as you get into your AOC block, uh, then some of that information has been provided to you, will be available to you. Uh, for the particular scenarios you're going to be going through in the classroom. So, good question. Sir? Is, uh, in your opinion, is there been an intercom, the APD, or the DOD incident that relates to uh, what you guys are doing today? Um, so, so, the INSCOM, the Intelligence uh, Security Command of the Army, uh, the DAG2, the Department of Army G2, what was the third? Army. AGB, Army, Army Geoint Battalion. Um, so, um, I think the Army GOM Battalion is fully embedded with NGA. They live right there with us. Uh, so that's an MI-05 command uh, that lives right there with NGA, the Army GOM Battalion. Um, and uh, so that continues the subordinate command to the National Ground Intelligence Center under INSCOM, uh, under the DAG-2. And so within the Army, I think I would go back to the one slide here that I, what I try to say the so what for you is you, there's a mindset change requirement. And I think that if we talk, if you want to talk specifically about the intelligence and the engineers, geospatial engineers and, geosp and MI officers, and so those two as leaders need to drive that you need to use anticipate. Anticipatory analysis is not something that you can learn by reading a book. It's a class, it's a how to think, analysis of how to think. Um, and a new way of doing business uh, based upon big data. We've got a lot more data now. How do, what do we do with it? If I'm not going to be RFI driven, then I've got to be driven by this big data. Um, you take the National Security Agency with all of its uh, collection of communications. That's big data. They have to exploit that quicker to anticipate what's occurring. And so keywords, uh, trying to describe where am I going to be attacked next? Uh, anticipating that and thwarting that particular uh, uh, operation. So I believe that's what I would say, uh, that the intelligence community of the Army, uh, if that's a word, but needs to start thinking, how do we think ahead? Uh, that's a very difficult process to do. It's a paradigm shift. Good question. Sir. Staff officer and commander, can I expect to 
be conducting operations that would directly contribute to NGA products? Yes, sir. I would hope so. I would, I would absolutely hope that you are. I would, now, the Army had the human terrain teams. Remember the human terrain teams. Uh, there were some successes and failures of that. Part of the failure, part of the successes with that is that you had teams that supported brigade commanders as they were fighting the fight. And so that was a, that was a near, that was a real-time support. The hard part was the data they collected was in flat files. It's in a PDF or a Word document. I can't put that into a database. I need, I need it, I need it into, I need someone with a handheld GPS going church, water well, uh, hospital, um, cholera outbreak, and putting a, an X and a Y with it, and then taking that into a database, bringing it up. And so, yes, I would say that every soldier is a sensor, and so that still continues. And I think uh, uh, that there's a paradigm shift with that, is that why not? Why wouldn't we have every soldier providing a unit, providing data up um, right now? So, Chris? We're, we're still doing that now. We have known. Uh, that's something that we're doing with certain uh, units that are already boots on the ground. And basically what it is is, is a... Can you use the microphone? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Here you go. <laughs> Basically what that is, is they, it's, a, it's an immediate update on what's going on on the ground. It says that these are the type of people that, type of people that live in this uh, neighborhood or village or this bridge has been blown out and here's an immediate update and everybody gets that, whoever's using GNOME. So that's, that's one, uh, uh, one example of how it's being fielded currently. But that is uh, a future capability that NGA has as part of the strategy, how we, can we get the information that we have and to the soldiers uh, instantaneously? Good point. And that's being done through like smartphones. Sir. Yes, sir. Um, as we get the ground to work with the new advanced capabilities that Russia's bringing to the table, particularly in the electronic warfare and cyber realms, what are the implications of the future of our adversaries being able to manipulate this data to, to spoof it, to, to interrupt our decision making process from a tactical level all the way up to strategic? I believe it's. It's very obvious, yes. Is it the ability, their capability, absolutely, and for us to find a counter to that? So countermeasures uh, for their ability. I think that uh, there's a combination of, uh, of us having, securing our data. Uh, sometimes we need to print information uh, is better than us having it on a digital platform. Uh, and so we're printing on demand. And so your ability to take what data we can collect and collect and collect uh, for us to have our data centers secure. Um, we, NGA, manages several different data centers in which we're managing a combination of classified uh, imagery, uh, unclassified imagery collection, multiple places, full motion video, uh, for us to collect that, keep that. And, and uh, so as far as a single particular enemy, I th think it's pretty much the same for any uh, type of, whether it's Russia or Iran or North Korea, or any other adversary, um, or even in a commercial industry. The commercial industry has a very difficult time even holding their own information. So the government has the same challenges. I don't think uh, we take countermeasures uh, as far as electronic warfare, information warfare. Uh, I think we, we're, we, have no, we have an upper hand as a government, but not much more, uh, minor upper hand. Um, I think we're going to get a very difficult process. Great question, though. Great thought. Sir, back to the Air Force. Um, so the answer is yes. It's called the bathymetric data. Oh, the coast, coast he left. There was a Coast Guard here. So, uh, right, bathymetric data. So bathymetric data and also a por heart, port and harbor databases. And so those are our responsibilities. Uh, to provide that charts, uh, that chart information, uh, absolutely. Digital nautical chart is our primary product uh, that we produce on a daily basis. In addition to something that Transcom, we're in collaboration with Transcom in the development of what's called geoports. We do geoports for A pods and S pods, so those air ports, air uh, points of demarcation and surface demar points of demarcation. And so those A pods, S pods, we do those. We build those diagrams on a constant basis, uh, provide those to the services through Transcom. 
So NGA is embedded with them. Uh, but the bathymetric data is our key uh, maritime product that we provide. Um, so mapping the bottom of the ocean is a pretty tough thing to do. Uh, and uh, so we're providing that in collaboration with the Navy. Uh, so that's, that's our, uh, and our expertise is on the East Coast to do that, uh, always has been um, in, col in collaboration with the Navy. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, you are. Um, so, I guess several different things. One is that I have a catalog. So there's a digital catalog that I have available. Um, no, actually we don't. Um, once we make a map, it becomes a logistics item. It has a national stock number, the same as a tire or a carburetor. And so we put a national stock number on there and so the logistics systems manages the pallets of these paper maps. And if we build a new series, a new edition, uh, then it will supersede that other one, that other one goes away. Uh, and so, so the answer is for the library purposes, you can absolutely get them. You can order them, uh, you'll have to get a bigger building. Uh, paper maps take up a lot of room. Yes. Yeah, Haiti. Absolutely, absolutely can do that. We can, you and I can collaborate to to make that happen. Uh, absolutely, um, they. Right. So maps, maps, and, and imagery are a snapshot in time. So they're they're basically expired by the time that I hand it to you, uh, because the Earth changes. Somebody's going to dig a new ditch, put up a new building, and so those kinds of changes are going to occur. Uh, so we're going to do it. We can do the best we can on providing that to you. Um, they're, they're, the other thing is, is that NGA is mandatory by uh, law for us to maintain a copy of everything we produce. Digits, paper, email, um, the same as you are the same as the Army is, to maintain a, paper, a, a trail, you can't delete anything. And so we don't delete anything. There's something to maintain that, whether it's on a tape library or it's on a on di disk, uh, so some form or another. Um, but as far as research goes, I understand. Um, I can work with you and, and make sure to do that, but the logistics process is pretty tough. One last question. One last question. Yes, sir. Well, um, please uh, tell me more. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I believe, so the several ways that I would try to approach this, one is that on a case-by-case -case basis, is that if, that if that basically comes to us uh, through a COCOM J2, that that COCOM J2 for us to look at a particular area for a particular, um, call it a, a tunnel, an entrance to a tunnel, um, as an example, is that, uh, so you tell me where you want me to look, uh, or I will give you the data so that you can exploit that and find the, what you're looking for. Uh, I will give that to you. Um, and, um, uh, and how to avoid, uh, provide that information to you based upon 
bare earth or reflective earth. So we have some challenges there uh, based upon vegetation or no vegetation. Uh, and so those are some challenges. Uh, but I think that we, we respond to the COCOM first. That, that geographic combatant commander is the one that, so to speak, owns the terrain. We're going to respond to their requirement. Um, so um, as a general rule, I think that we're, we're doing pretty good uh, on finding the targets that are necessary or being requested. Uh, so thanks. Good, good question. Thank you, Rod. Appreciate it. <laughs> well, Mr. Irwin will he'll be able to stay after those who want to talk to him. I also note that his office is up on the fourth floor. I want to reciprocate. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Rod. <laughs> we appreciate you very much the talk. I'm going to remind you again next month. The presentation will be on the twelfth of October by the Federal Bureau of Investigation right here, twelve thirty, in the market calendars. And lastly, I'll make a note. Um, Ralph did a book review in the latest edition of the Interagency Journal. If you're not familiar with our magazine that we put out, um, you can pick up a copy down by the barbershop on the rack here down there, down the third floor. And it's all about interagency subjects and topics. Yes, sir. Your leading staff people can borrow this. Sorry, just for the betterment of the group, Mr. Irwin actually came into our group to give that 45-minute uh, lecture on the resources available. That allowed us to do our strategic estimate of GATT in like two seconds. So <laughs> I, I highly recommend if you guys are able to do that, please have them go into your classroom. We're in prep for your next assignment. <laughs> Barb's all over that. <laughs> but what that does, though, I will leverage this. You have on your faculty here, not only the people that you see routinely on your team, which have great expertise, there is similar outstanding expertise in the interagency community. Folks are sitting around here in the room if you haven't met. Thank you. <laughs> and triple T. I'm going next doing week. That? Oh, are you? I am, yeah. I got, I got, going. Uh,